care of the U.S. by others cannot be underestimated. As the late conservative political scientist Samuel Huntington acknowledged in 1996, The West won the war not by the superiority of its ideas or values or religion, but rather by its superiority in the application of organized violence. Westerners often forget this fact. Non-Westerners never do. Progressive China experts fear the U.S. is once again employing Truman's 1946 playbook with the Soviet Union in an attempt to contain China. The same situation exists once again with Western revulsion for China's internal policies. But this time, holding $1 trillion in U.S. Treasury bonds, the Chinese could imperil the U.S. economy in ways the Soviets never could. Historian Alfred McCoy delineated the real stakes when he wrote, as early as 2020, the Pentagon hopes to patrol the entire globe ceaselessly, relentlessly, via a triple canopy space shield, reaching from stratosphere to exosphere, driven by drones armed with agile missiles. The triple canopy should be able to blind an entire army by knocking out ground communications, avionics, and naval navigation. But as McCoy cautions, the illusion of technological invincibility and information omniscience has failed arrogant nations in the past, as the fate of Germany in World War II and the US in Vietnam attest. With tragic irony, McCoy reminds us that the US is veto of global lethality might be an equalizer for any further loss of economic strength, and that the U.S.'s fate might well be determined by which comes first in this century-long cycle, military debacle from the illusion of technological mastery, or a new technological regime powerful enough to perpetuate U.S. global dominion. But as a popular series of Star Wars movies shows, a nation dominating the world with its technology will soon become a tyranny Rise, my friend. that will be hated by those who are tyrannized. China may become the first new empire to emerge in this nuclear-armed world, but an empire modeled on the US or British versions would be a disaster. The great Han, Chauvinism would be no better than American exceptionalism. Former defense official Joseph Nye observed that the dominant power's failure to integrate the rising powers of Germany and Japan into the 20th century global system resulted in two catastrophic world wars. History must not be allowed to repeat itself again. The Chinese must shun the American example, and the U.S. must reverse course. Henry Wallace worried that if the U.S. treated the Soviets so badly when the U.S. was riding high economically and militarily, how would the Soviets treat the U.S. when and if the situation was reversed? It never happened, but this race to the bottom, he understood, would have no winner. As we close out this series, we must ask ourselves humbly, in looking back at the American century, have we acted wisely and humanely in our relations to the rest of the world? A world in which the richest few hundred or a thousand or a couple thousand have more wealth than the poorest three billion? Have we been right to police the globe? Have we been a force for good, for understanding, for peace? We must look in the mirror. Have we perhaps in our self-love become the angels of our own despair? The claims of victory in the Second World War and justification for the atomic bomb dropped on Japan, though aimed at the Soviet Union, were the founding myths of our domination and national security state. And the nation's elites have benefited from that. The bomb has allowed us to win by any means necessary, which makes us, because we win, right. And because we are right, we are therefore good. Under these conditions, there is no morality but our own. As Secretary of State Madeleine Albright said, but if we have to use force, it is because we are America. We are the indispensable nation. Because we can and have threatened humanity with a bomb, our mistakes are forgiven, 
and our cruelties justified as benignly motivated aberrations. But domination doesn't last. Five major empires have collapsed in the lifetime of a person born before World War II. Britain, France, Germany, Japan, and the Soviet Union. Three more empires earlier in the 20th century, the Russian, Austro-Hungarian, and Ottoman. If history is a barometer, the United States domination will end as well. We wisely resisted becoming a colonial empire and most Americans would deny all imperial pretensions. Perhaps that is why we cling so doggedly to the myth of American exceptionalism, American uniqueness, benevolence, generosity. Maybe in that fanciful notion lies the seeds of American redemption, the hope that the United States will live up to that vision which seemed within grasp in 1944 when Wallace almost became president, or 1953 when Stalin died with a new U.S. president in office, or JFK and Khrushchev in 1963, or Bush and Gorbachev in 89, or Obama in 2008. History has shown us the curve of the ball could have broken differently. These moments will come again in a different form. Will we be ready? I think back to Franklin Roosevelt on the last day of his life, cabling Churchill. I would minimize the Soviet problem as much as possible because these problems in one form or another seem to arise every day and most of them straighten out. Calming down the situations that occur, letting things happen without overreacting, seeing the world through the eyes of our adversaries. This way lies in sharing in the needs of other countries with true empathy and compassion, trusting a collective will of this planet to survive the coming period, ending the threats of nuclear annihilation and global warming. Can we not surrender our exceptionalism and our arrogance? Can we not cut out the talk of domination? Can we stop appealing to God to bless America over other nations? Hardliners and nationalists will object, but theirs has proven not to be the way. A young woman said to me in the 1970s, we need to feminize this planet. I thought it strange then, but now I realize there's power in love, real power in real love. Let us find a way back to respect the law, not of the jungle, but the law of civilization by which we first came together and put aside our differences to preserve the things that matter. Herodotus wrote in the fifth century before Christ, the first history was written in the hope of preserving from decay the remembrance of what men have been. And for that reason, the history of man is not only one of blood and death, but one also of honor, achievement, kindness, memory, and civilization. There is a way forward by remembering the past. And then we can start step by step like a baby reaching for the stars. For in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet we all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's futures. And we are all mortal.